you all so much for coming out here this afternoon. A real pleasure uh, to see you all, uh, to, to, to put some faces on some old friends, <laughs> make some new friends. Uh, I'd especially like to thank uh, Beyond Nuclear and, and the Goethe Institute for hosting, hosting us today. Uh, it really is wonderful. And of course, the reason we're here today is to, uh, to discuss the, uh, the two major recent, most recent nuclear disasters, uh, the Chernobyl disaster from just over 30 years ago and the Fukushima disaster from five years ago. And, and most of you in this room, I think, are probably familiar with much of the details associated with that. So I'm not going to give you too much background since we've only got 10 minutes or so, 12 minutes. I'm just going to give you some highlights uh, of, of the work that we've been doing mostly over the last decade or so uh, related to our studies of the wildlife in the area. Uh, the first sort of question or hypothesis that comes up whenever you talk about what are the effects of radiation really has you know, to do with genetic damage. That's where people tend to start. Uh, that's sort of, sort of the, the most fundamental level of inherited uh, kind of effect, although there's been, uh, of course, uh, other developments in genetics and related fields in the last few years that have also in of great interest. But just starting with the simplest case, uh, you know, genetic damage comes in the form of either the direct effects on DNA, uh, single and double strand breaks, or some variant on that theme, or indirect effects uh, resulting from the oxidative stress caused by the ionization of water uh, that the radiation can do. So, the first result, uh, this, this is really summarized in a, a review paper we published last year where we took all of the studies we could find ever written uh, in any language <laughs> related to studies of genetic consequences of the, the radiation associated with the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, everything from bacteria to, to people and, and everything in between. And put them all together into a, a, a sort of a, a modern statistical method known as meta-analysis. It's, it's increasingly popular for the analysis of, of, of uh, different kinds of data sets, putting them together to, to get at questions of greater interest. And, and the basic fundamental result from this analysis, uh, about 151 separate comparisons, separate studies of, of genetic effects. And in each one of those studies is actually one of these little red bars here. And this is the effect size and this is zero, and any of these bars that do not cross the zero bar are significant effects, statistically speaking. The overwhelming majority of these studies show highly significant genetic consequences of the Chernobyl radiation. Um, there are a few down here that show <laughs> a positive effect, but um, you can, kind of makes you wonder. Maybe there is such a thing as hormesis, eh? But, uh, the vast majority show negative consequences. That's right. So this, this, is, this is on a standard deviation uh, scaling uh, where all of the studies have been uh, transformed so that we can compare the effect sizes across different studies of different kinds of animals, different types of traits. It's, it's the, a method that is inherent to the meta-analysis method. Oh, really? Oh, okay, sorry. I think we need to turn the treble up, but <laughs> the bass down. Um, sorry, yes, so each one of these is a uh, statistically modified comparison. The second sort of general observation that we've made this past year is a similar kind of analysis, in this case related to the importance of oxidative stress. And you know, you remember my second slide where I showed direct effects breaking up chromosomes and then the indirect effects related to the ionization of water generating peroxides which chemically affect the DNA, affect DNA repair Reflect, affect proteins, affect cell membranes. Uh, and what this review was, again, was an analysis of every study that we could find for Chernobyl-affected systems, 
where we look at the relationship between antioxidant status, oxidative stress, and some form of damage or injury to either a tissue or the whole organism, depending on what was available. The overwhelming results show that there is this trade-off between antioxidant status and sensitivity of radiation to oxidative stress. This suggests that oxidative stress may be a really important component of how individuals are damaged related to this radiation. This again was, this was the, uh, this, the first chapter of one of my Ukrainian PhD students, so he was particularly proud of this. Um, right, so, so we got radiation, we got genetic damage, we've got, what does this lead to? Well, again, we've been uh, sort of tackling every possible system <laughs> that we can, uh, kind of opportunistically. And, and, you know, what we found, just to summarize, is that we see major effects on fertility. Uh, sperm, male fertility, seems to be particularly vulnerable to oxidative stress. Interestingly, just a couple months ago, a group out of Oxford University has come up with a new treatment for male infertility in humans. You know what it is? No, no, it's antioxidants, of course. <laughs> antioxidants, uh, again. Uh, pointing to this issue of oxidative stress as one of the sort of overriding mechanisms of damage related to radiation in this case. Uh, cataracts in birds and rodents. Again, cataracts, one of the first things observed in atomic bomb survivors. Uh, it's frequently observed in people who are exposed to radiation um, on, a, on a daily basis. And of course, tumors, we all think of cancers. Uh, again, we see examples of tumors. Uh, in birds, and, and now we're starting to see them in uh, the rodents that we've been studying in Chernobyl and Fukushima as well. Uh, brain size, the, uh, uh, the medical folks in this area have long made note of the sensitivity of developing neurological tissue to oxidative stress and ionizing radiation, and, and we're seeing it in the birds and the mammals, and many other kinds of developmental malformations in all sorts of different organisms. So that's sort of the, the bottom line. And let me just skip through a couple of specific examples for your entertainment. Um, so yeah, for instance, in this one study uh, published a couple of years ago, we found that the birds living in the most radioactive parts of Chernobyl, up to 40% of the male birds had either no sperm at all or a few dead sperm. Uh, and uh, again, that came as a, quite a surprise to us. But, uh, but perhaps not too surprising if, this, if, you, if you're somebody who studies radiation effects on fertility. Again, uh, another paper from a couple of years ago. We, uh, it, took us, it took us five or six years to actually get our hands on physically enough birds <laughs> to actually do the statistical analysis, because it's a lot of work catching birds. And uh, so after four or five years, we had several thousand birds to play with from Chernobyl and uh, allowed us to do the statistics where we basically show that again, uh, there are, first of all, you know, there are birds in Chernobyl with tumors. You just don't see this in most natural populations. It's an extreme rarity to see a wild animal with a tumor uh, because what happens to them? If you have a tumor, you, you, you're not likely to survive very long. So what that means is that there's probably many more birds, uh, animals in Chernobyl with tumors, we just don't see most of them. But because there's so many of them, we see quite a few more than usual. And, uh, and of course, this is a... Uh, <laughs> my wife tells me I'm a terrible public speaker because I never tell enough jokes. But uh, uh, I was gonna say something about this great tit with this big tumor, but it's one of the most famous great tits in the world, I think. Anyway, this is just one example of, of the animals that have visible tumors. We're finding in the rodents that most of the tumors are internal. You rarely see them on the outside. Uh, according to the mammologist, this isn't surprising. Uh, cataracts, again, when we started looking at the eyes of the birds, much higher frequencies of cataracts in the eyes. Uh, and we started looking at the rodents a couple of years ago, and uh, again, the same sort of pattern. 
you know, again, uh, smaller brains uh, reflecting neurological effects of, on neurological development. Again, we're starting to see this in the rodents as well in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. But the main question that I, that I have been uh, trying to tackle, we've been trying to tackle for the last few years, is this issue of whether or not all of these kinds of injuries to individuals really matter in an ecological or evolutionary sense. Does it add up to effects on population dynamics? Does it add up to lower population sizes? Uh, and so we've taken a, a rather unique approach to dealing with this, certainly never been <laughs> done in the, uh, in the radiation field, uh, whereby we, and, and, and the problem with disasters in general is that you don't really know what was there before the disaster, ever. You know, you have maybe an inkling, but nobody has done the, the baseline study that would be really needed to do a really fantastic job. And so you have to sort of ad lib it. And the way we've done it is to infer historical distributions based on patterns that we currently observe in adjacent areas that are clean, relatively clean. But the only way you can do this is if you really hammer the area with all sorts of surveys. So in Chernobyl, we've done about 900 surveys across 300 locations for all of the birds and insects that we can find. In Fukushima, we've repeated this uh, for four years so far. We're going back in July this year at 400 different locations uh, from very, very contaminated to as clean as we can possibly find. And we use this fairly uh, relatively simple approach where we, you know, we take these inventories of all the organisms at all these different spots, but then we also measure everything else about that spot that might be important for the distribution and abundance. You know, is there water, is there trees, what kind of plants are there? We measure, excuse me, we measure the radiation levels, we use some GIS, we use a little bit of multivariate statistics, and from that we can generate our partial relationships that are related just to the radiation, independent of all these other environmental effects. And what, when you do this, its results are they're, they're overwhelming. In Chernobyl, in Chernobyl, every group of organisms that we've looked at shows some negative consequence of the high radiation. Not every individual species, not every individual, but every group overall. In Fukushima, we found that the birds and the butterflies were the first to show some consequences, with the birds really, really striking. Uh, and this, this figure right here basically shows, this shows how many birds you're likely to see at any given point in Fukushima where the radiation level is 30 microsieverts per hour versus points in the same area not so far away at less than one microsievert per hour. And again, you see a very, very, very strong relationship uh, of abundance with radiation. Same for biodiversity. This is the probability of seeing more than one nope species at a given spot here in high radiation versus low radiation. Highly, highly significant result. What we did this last year, though, is we teamed up with a group in France to, to actually reconstruct the doses to individual birds, the 7,000 or so birds that we have been monitoring for the last four years. We, we took these reconstructed doses and plot that against the abundance, and you get this very, very striking negative pattern uh, with no evidence of any kind of threshold. Uh, so very clearly, strong effects. Uh, it's not just the birds and the bees, but also the trees, so ecosystem level effects. Some of you have seen this photo before. This is one of my photos showing the effects of a major sort of qualitative effect on some of the trees in the area. You, some of you may have heard of the fact that decomposition, the microbial community, is affected by the radiation, leading to larger community effects. And then finally, our, our most recent paper, uh, where we actually were looking to see if maybe, given all this stress, maybe all this selection going on, maybe some animals are adapting. Uh, and we actually found one system of bacteria that showed some signs that they might actually have evolved some level of, of adaptation. But for the most part, none of them do. So what does this all mean? Well, the, the, boss, the bottom line is that contrary to some of those 
optimistic reports you may have heard about how uh, the animals are thriving in Chernobyl <laughs> and, and how uh, the fact that we have a fence around the place uh, allows for these organisms to thrive because there's you know, no hunting. Those aren't entirely accurate, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and so uh, one needs to be, pay much closer attention to, to what's actually going on by doing the science. Um, so and the other two key points to all of our studies is that effect seems to be proportional to the dose, and there's no evidence of any kind of threshold below which there's no effect observable. Your power to detect the effects goes, goes way down, but, but it's always there. And with that, I'll stop, and thank you all very much.